Hi everybody. Uh, today's walk is on a fascinating world of insects. You know, insects are on the base of the food chain, forming the base on which the whole ecosystem of our world is based. So the preservation and study of insects gives us the best indication of the health of our ecosystem. Uh, today, this fascinating journey, uh, Hayat is going to conduct that. Hayat Mohammed is an IT professional with a fascination for insects. In his spare time, he studies and photographs these insects. This has made him knowledgeable both about insects and insect macro photography. Today, he is accepted as an expert in insects as well as an accomplished macro photographer. Well, we will today, I will talk about the identification of insects, their behavior. And by the end of the session, we would have gained further knowledge on the insect world. So, so without boring you any further, and this talk is going to be something around an hour, 50 minutes, and after that will be a question and answer session. So without uh, any further, it's over to you, Hayat. Hayat, the stage is yours. Thank you, Shan, for the awesome introduction. I'm not sure I deserve all that. But yeah, I'm, I, the insects, are, insects and uh, macro photography is something which is uh, more of a passion for me. Uh, so thank you for having me over and providing the platform. I hope uh, this does uh, give a good insight into the uh, fascinating world. And more of us, like birding and other forms of uh, watching wildlife, do begin watching insects and documenting them as well. So that's the whole intent of uh, this. Yeah. All right. So what I'll do is just go ahead and. Uh, sorry. Hello. Everybody, please put their videos off so we get more bandwidth. Yes. Thank you, everyone. All right. I'm hoping. You're able to see the uh, slide that says fascinating world of insects. Yes. Okay, perfect. Let's get started. So uh, good evening and uh, let's get started on this uh, fascinating journey uh, through the view of my lens. Uh, so the first question, well, most of uh, the people who ask me is why do you go and photograph insects, right? So, uh, so I go back a couple of steps and ask myself, why is the, why is there a necessity to even observe or uh, document the various insects and arthropods around us, right? So let, let me ask you a simple question, right? So say for instance, uh, uh, there's a question which says, uh, give the number of uh, tigers in the country. So there's census which is done very regularly, right? And there's a general uh, number which is available offhand. Right, and come uh, when you get onto other mammals or birds, they're quite visible. Right, but there's also like uh, Shan was mentioning, they form a critical part of the food chain, and often are very good indicators about the uh, health of the ecosystem. And th watching those can give us uh, great insights on managing the uh, mini ecosystems a lot faster. And maybe if there is certain action to be taken that gives us some bit of lead time as well. Uh, so sorry, just one second. Uh, Shan or uh, uh, Nikhil? So there are these uh, things which says, um, admit or yeah. you will be taking care of that. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, perfect, sure. All right, so that's one. And the second factor also is, see, I firmly believe uh, humans were meant to be living with nature and observing everything. So there's a reason why we feel at ease when we are in the lap of mother nature, observing everything, having that whole sensory overload, be it uh, visuals, viewing stuff, smelling the good uh, flowers, observing everything around it. So being in nature is, to me at least, is a sensory overload, which is, which is a welcome break from the whole uh, dampening of senses that happens within the uh, concrete jungle. So then moving on to the saying now, 
we see insects quite a lot around us, yes? So if I were to ask a simple question, when was the last time you saw an elephant? So depending on uh, your level of uh, expertise and how crazy you are about wildlife, so the answer might differ. But for sure, it is not going to be in the hundreds or not going to be something which you find on a regular basis, unless until you live close to an elephant corridor or in a jungle. Right? But what you also notice is you will find a lot of insects all around you, be it in a balcony, be it uh, some, some moths or other insects which get attracted to light during the evenings, or be it uh, wasps and other uh, spiders in your garden. And that garden doesn't really have to be uh, elaborate and big. It could be as few as a few pots just in your balcony or uh, in the patio. So when you start studying insects, you'll actually begin to understand the definition of a habitat doesn't really have to be a few square kilometers or a few square acres. It could be as small as just one plant. One plant or a tree can actually host a phenomenal mind-boggling uh, number of uh, arthropods and insects. Right? So in order to do that, what they do is they these insects have various strategies to survive and thrive. So before we get to how they survive and thrive, I'll just give you a quick introduction of uh, how the insects life cycle generally is, right? So on the left, you notice th this is a three stage cycle where the egg out of the egg, a young version of the adult hatches out. Uh, Kaveri Ganguly has raised hand. So if there are any questions, uh, we could park them or yeah, maybe hi, sorry, sorry to bother, but we'll sure. take questions in the end after the hour is over. We we'll take yeah. questions in the end. Uh, so probably they can leave it out in the chat, perhaps, and uh, somebody can pick it up later. Yeah, all right. Uh, so uh, this life stage, the three uh, stage life cycle is where from the egg, a young version of the adult hatches out and that version is called the nymph, right? So from here on, there are multiple molting that occurs and that finally turns into the uh, adult form. And on the right, you have uh, from the eggs, there's a larval stage and from the larval stage, you have a pupil stage, right? So they go ahead and uh, form a pupa and this pupa is where they spend most of the time conserving energy and metamor uh, so there's this process called metamorphosis where they change shape completely from the larval stage into pupa and then emerge out as a adult right so uh, all of the uh, butterflies and moths go down this as well as the beetles follow the uh, four stage process Right. So on the left, we noticed uh, that a youngling goes ahead and for, becomes an adult. So what it does during each of it is uh, these are called instars, right? Where there are several forms of the nymph, and uh, most of these, uh, like the beetles, are the most easiest example to give. So that they have a very hard chitin, chitin structure, right? So this pro provides a Iron Man-like shield which protects them uh, from all the external thing. So imagine uh, you got, you stayed as part of the lockdown and you gorged yourself and you grew for a bit and you no longer fit in the Iron Man suit you bought say about a year ago, what would you do? For us humans, it's easy. We just go ahead and buy a new Iron Man suit. Yes, but for insects that doesn't happen. So what uh, they need to do is they need to literally crawl out of their older shell, which is too small for them to, for the future cells to fit. And that process is called molting. So I've, I'll probably show that in the uh, coming few slides. Right. So the first things uh, that happens in the life cycle are eggs, right? So eggs are sought after as nutrition from a lot of different predators, right? So in order to have some protection, most of, some of these come with the uh, hard uh, structures and some come with these 
even these uh, things which look like flaps on the shell, right? So this, this almost looks like a, a top which has a fixed, uh, uh, what, what, what's the easiest way to call it? A fixed lid, so to speak, right? So imagine you're an insect and you have to come and lay an egg, right? And you get to know that there's a cylindrical structure on which you have, you're supposed to go lay the egg. And at times, so some uh, beetles of, sorry, not beetles, some uh, bugs of the uh, uh, shield bug family will lay an exact of 12 eggs. So imagine a bug which knows math, right? And if that wasn't fascinating enough, it's not just the math of numbers, but it also has to do a math of circumference. So it has to figure out how thick this branch is and start laying the eggs so that they form this cylindrical structure. So you actually notice there are a few eggs which, which are just out of sight as well. And they are forming this equal circle on the other side. So you see four, three, two, and the other side as well as there is three, two, and then one. If that's not fascinating enough, I don't know what is, right? So it, this just blew my mind in terms of the kind of uh, calculative stuff that can happen to uh, arthropod or an insect. And also there's this uh, great aesthetic value it sort of shows. So this almost look like, uh, uh, what's the easiest way to put it? Uh, porcelain vases, right? And here's, so these look like uh, the thin uh, firecrackers that we use during Diwali, but trust me, these aren't that. So these are the eggs of a uh, assassin bug. So you can also notice this also has a pretty good uh, protective structure, which is bound by a jelly-like thing. So you can notice they're all stuck to each other. And they also form a pyramid-like structure, right? Where you can see there's a much solid base. And then as you be uh, begin to go to the top, it be the numbers begin to taper off. And just like the earlier part, these also have these lids. And these are the lids which the nymph pushes open to emerge out into the world. Right, so we noticed the earlier Pentatomidae uh, shield bugs, right? So we would have mentioned saying, hey, uh, they're so good, nothing really can happen to them. But what can also is this thing called a wasp infestation. So here you can notice the colors are a lot different, but what's happened here is uh, parasitic wasps have come and injected eggs into each of these. So I think barring this particular egg, all of the others have uh, wasps consuming the egg from within and waiting to emerge out as parasitic wasps. So you also notice, right? So uh, in the earlier case, we saw the eggs were bound around a stem, but in this case, uh, it's just flat on a leaf. And the bottom uh, left here, if you notice, the, it's slightly raised from the surface of the leaf, which also goes to show how uh, they're tightly bound they are. So moving on to the next. So here's a telomonia, a two-striped uh, jumping spider taking care of her egg clutch. Right? We always used to think that, hey, parenting is something which humans do great or mammals do great. But guess what? Even in the insect and arthropod kingdom, that still exists. So prior to uh, this going ahead and settling down with the eggs, she'll go ahead and spin a different thickness of silk to cover the surface of the leaf, which will act as a temporary housing for her. And all this while, she'll not leave the side of the eggs, even to feed. Right? And fun fact of these uh, jumping spiders, or most of the other spiders, they can produce varying thicknesses of silk based on the need. So the th uh, silk that is produced to wrap the uh, prey is going to be of a different thickness versus what they use to jump from uh, one vantage point to the other. That's called a drag line like Spider-Man, right? It uses its 
um, open palm to squirt out a st strand where it gets stuck. These guys also have a similar thing where uh, through the spinneret, they go ahead and release a different thing and then use that as a drag line to ensure even if they don't uh, go and land safely enough, there's that uh, bungee cord to, for them to not fall through to the ground. All right, moving on. So we all have fences around our houses, right? A very human thing to do. But guess what? Even the insect kingdom has, has its own. So here you see another jumping spider, which has gone ahead and used a few thorns to prevent anybody from approaching this. So I'm not sure if the, I got this uh, uh, in the midst of it building, or this is how the uh, spider uses it based on the gravitation uh, side. Pretty fascinating. Right. So we, we earlier uh, went ahead and saw the jumping spider taking care of it uh, within a leaf surface, right? But there are other spiders like this uh, green link spider, which goes ahead and makes an egg sac out of it. It binds the eggs together and then holds it under her abdomen and does not move anywhere at all. So she remains a dedicated mother for as long as up to two to three weeks. And what comes out is this, right? So you see the freshly hatched spiderlings in the background and an unfortunate uh, winged ant which provided maybe one of the first few meals in several weeks for this mother. So here's another thing, what we call these the cellar spiders. So you notice the mother here with her uh, freshly hatched set of spiderlings. So you can actually notice the yolk or so to speak the uh, thing from in the abdomen and some of them which have already consumed it so you see there's a slight size difference as well any questions i'll just take a pause so far hi i think the questions we'll do in the end let's okay. finish it and we'll take them all in the end done all right so moving on so here we notice the uh, set of pentatomidae or the shield bug eggs, right? So what hatch out of it uh, were, are the nymphs which look like this, right? So we, red is not a color which is seen too often in the natural world, right? Barring a few birds or maybe very bright jewel beetles. So the, these, including the shield bugs, they do not really remain in this manner. So what happens is the moment they hatch out of the eggs, the with the reaction to the uh, air. So they begin to change color and they tend to, the chitin in the thing begins to harden and they get a lot more dark colored, right? So what happens as this is, uh, so I know, I remember I told you about how they have a protective shell that they're born with and what happens when they're growing. They're growing sooner uh, during the initial phases and begin to slow down as they approach the adult stage, right? So what happens next? Uh, oh, sorry, I just missed the slide. Uh, we'll come back to what happens next. So here's again the uh, nymphs of what we call as bark lice. So you see, there is good safety in numbers. So they tend to huddle up and stay together till they are uh, slightly independent. Right, so coming on to this. So here are a couple of uh, uh, corridae or what we call as uh, leaf-footed bugs, right? So these leaf-footed bugs have hatched out of these golden eggs. And what have, what's happened is they undergo this mass molting process. So for the first couple of molds, the nymphs will tend to hang around together for uh, getting this uh, advantage of safety in numbers. So they, uh, the first couple of molds happen uh, en masse, and then they begin to scatter. So you see the eggs on top and the first few molds below, the same leaf. Right. 
So coming on to uh, once the molting is done, right? So in this, uh, so this is what we call as the pupil phase. So we, so far we saw the three stage process. So this is the fourth one, right? Where here's a pupa of a moth, which has finished uh, feeding off. And that's the only thing it does during its caterpillar phase. And it's gone ahead and built this nice uh, fortress for itself, where it'll uh, rest while it emerges out as a adult with wings, right? Another fun fact here is uh, the, as soon as the moths and the butterflies emerge, there will be, if it's the female which is emerging, there'll be the um, male waiting to go ahead and copulate and so that the next generation starts. Right, so we spoke about how, uh, as they keep growing, they need to get rid of their protective outer shell. So here you see a gaudy grasshopper just going ahead and molting. So you would notice the exoskeleton on the left and you see how perfect it is a replica of the structure of the insect itself. So you can actually notice, uh, are you able to see the zoomed version? Yeah. Can see it. yeah. Uh, so you notice the undulation of the eye, the mouth, and the structure on the legs, which matches this. So that way, molds give a very good uh, opportunity to actually study uh, insect uh, morphology. Right. So in this case, uh, these were a couple of uh, dragonfly nymphs. And here I just happened to chance upon a very favorite perch of theirs. And the final one even used the earlier molted uh, exuvia or the outer exoskeleton uh, to hang on and come out or emerge into the world. So the process of emergence is pretty amazing, right? So, so on the left, you notice here's a cicada, so which can spend its uh, years, quite a few number of, the majority of the years rather, underground. So some say it can be as high as uh, 14 to 15 years. So they go ahead and uh, crawl out of the damp soil, find a good perch. And if you notice, it's hard to fathom how an uh, insect which is this long, which you can see here, was crammed into a shell that small. Right? So this uh, cicada just emerged and broke out of this uh, shell. And this whole process, we waited for about two to three hours in the middle of uh, the Western Ghats to go ahead and uh, enthrall our eyes to this amazing spectacle, right? So you notice how it went ahead and crawled out. You see the uh, proboscis, which is, uh, which is used to uh, suck on uh, uh, plant uh, fluids and also the uh, wings which are yet to unfurl, right? So this lets out uh, and uses gravity to let these wings unfurl. And then these neon colors stay for a very uh, small amount of time. And as it uh, reacts with the air, it tends to darken. And on the right, you notice a two-tailed spider which just broke out of its older exoskeleton. And you notice how it is almost lying lifeless. Right? It's because it's used a majority of the energy that it had into squeezing out of its tight shell. And this is a time where uh, they are predated quite often and they are very uh, prone to attacks. Right, so next moving on. So that's not the only way, right? So you, uh, what you see on the screen here is a rolled up millipede. So millipedes provide a great uh, indicator of uh, forest floor health. So in this case, uh, as it uh, got to know that we were approaching, it rolled up into this perfect uh, Fibonacci circle or a roll, rolled into a ball, which is very defensive. And this again, if you uh, are uh, curious enough, the next time you probably see this, you can probably just touch the surface and you'll get to know how hard the outer skeleton is. 
So first thoughts, somebody would say, hey, this looks like a dung or a snail. But what this actually is, is a snail or a dung mimic spider called a sitarachne. So you can actually see, if I zoom in, you see the spider's eyes. You see one, two, three, four, and two more here. So all, uh, most spiders have eight eyes and eight legs. So you see how well this uh, fits in. And you also see the kind of mimicry that exists, right? It also mimics the shape of a snail and also the droplets, which are not real. So moving on, camouflage again is a great uh, way of uh, surviving and thriving, right? So you can't get eaten if you aren't uh, noticed by other predators. Or in this case, uh, the bark mantis uses it for ambushing predators on the bark as well. So you see how well camouflaged this whole thing is. Right, people who've seen me shoot this pass by and they're like, uh, why are you just shooting twigs? And I literally had to show them this image saying this is not a twig, but this is the end of a geometric moth caterpillar. You can actually see the eyes here and the pro legs. Mimicry at its finest form. So here again, on uh, we generally found, find these on uh, curry leaves. You can see uh, at a certain angle, this, because of the lighting, it doesn't really pop. But if you walk right past at a surf and you see it from the top, it'll look exactly like a bird dung dropping. So here's, I think, uh, Papilio, I'm not sure which. I think it's a Mormon moth, uh, sorry, Mormon uh, caterpillar. So first thoughts, the moment you see this, what springs to mind is, hey, that's a very interesting looking ant. But it is not an ant, but this is an ant mimicking mantis. Right? We all have, during our childhood, we've had, uh, based on how curious and how playful we've been out, we've had uh, less than ideal experiences with ants where they've gone ahead and bitten us, right from a slight burning sensation to a solid pinch. And in the insect kingdom, they are pretty, uh, or rather, uh, nobody uh, tries to predate on ants too often. And that is why this is called uh, some, something known as Bactesian mimicry, where one individual goes ahead and uh, mimics the structure or form of a different uh, spe uh, species. So this again, right? So this looks from far, it'll look perfectly like a weaver ant with the abdomen, long legs. That is only with human vision and macro photography that it, we're able to see the a set of eight eyes. And this is a ant mimicking jumping spider. And you also notice the long chalice array and it has two eye-like structures to really fool the ants around. So coming to the next thing. So this definitely looks like just a piece of uh, broken leaf on a structure, right? right? Right from the venation to the colors. So this is actually a flatted a plant hopper, which is blended perfectly. And it's only with, due to the uh, macro photography with flash that it really brings out these colors. So here's again a crab spider waiting on the flower for any passing by bee or a butterfly. So imagine you are just a a bee or a butterfly who's been um, going around looking for nectar, you wouldn't even notice this. You get in close uh, striking distance and bam, there you have it, your prey. Right, very nice image of a flower, right? That is, unless you fail to notice that there's also a green link spider, which is perfectly camouflaged with it. So you notice a spider here. The legs and the overall structure blends in perfectly with this. So on the left, if you notice, this will look just like a broken piece of twig. This is a poultice uh, orb weaver. And on the right, you notice the, uh, the close-up of the earlier uh, link spider. 
and you'll see how the greens really blend in with the whole surrounding. On the left, again, there's a geometrid moth, which blends in perfectly with the whole peppering and the scale pattern, which matches that of the bark. And on the right is the pupa of a common rose. So you can see how it has even just gone ahead and lassoed itself using a thin piece of uh, fiber. I think the fiber again is produced by itself. This would be likely silk. And you can see how protective the whole structure is. And what will emerge out of this is going to be a beautiful adult butterfly. So we noticed so far, uh, camouflage looking like other things is very important. And here you see this uh, catered as well with its really long antenna. You really have to see this to uh, believe it. And you notice how it, it even folds the antennae in such a manner that the antennae do not go out of the structure of the leaf. Fits in perfectly and the uh, lines match those on the parent uh, or the uh, host leaf. Again, talking about uh, numbers and camouflage, you can, this bark on the left was uh, filled with these uh, shield bugs. And you could walk past nine out of 10 times without even noticing them. And on the right, again, uh, safety in numbers, Allididae or uh, broad-headed bug nymphs, brightly colored uh, to give out uh, warnings. So here's a uh, image showing pretty much uh, the whole life cycle, right? So you see the eggs of the uh, Platyspidae uh, thing. You can see, notice a few of them emerging from here. And as they grow, you can see the various different sizes and they get, a, get to ten, tend to get a lot more hairier. And you see these uh, slightly larger nymph forms. So you see one, two, three are just hatching out from the eggs, the others hanging around and the nymphs which are slightly older. Right, so here's a dung beetle, right? So when you're taking images, when you're trying to notice, it's also important you try, you, you'll get a fair bit of understanding of how they operate. So these, once you see this image and you see them in action, it will not be too hard to understand why they're called dung beetles. They clean up dung, use that and roll it up into a ball, uh, taking it back into their uh, underground burrow. Here's the adult form of one of the alidid or the broad-headed bugs. So you notice how well camouflaged they are against the leaf. And it's only when it's shot up close that you can notice them. So on the left, you see this brightly colored tiger beetle. So this is the equivalent of having uh, of a cheetah of the mammal world. So this is the la la fastest running land insect ever recorded. Comes in this beautiful, stunning uh, colors. And on the right, we have a nathopalistus or a green huntsman spider resting. And you can also notice how it has uh, left out a few uh, strands of silk across to alert it in case anything uh, approaches close enough. So again, ambush is something which is used very uh, often and widespread. Spiders use it to great effect. So here's a small uh, cr uh, crab spider on la camouflage perfectly on the lantern of flowers. So here's a mating pair of uh, I think crimson rose butterflies. And on the bark, right, you'll notice, uh, you'll find a lot of these things called the hercilia or the two-tailed spiders. So again, with their uh, awesome vision, they go ahead and uh, rest on the bark, waiting for any uh, ambush with the unsuspecting prey. You walk past this and you'll probably just think this is a piece of broken bamboo, but it's not. So this is a mantis, which mimics the structure 
and texture of uh, bamboo. And while we saw all of this, right? So we noticed how it is, it tries to blend in, but on the other scale, you also have these brilliant ones, right? So here's a, a fruit fly called the Tefritidae. So you can see how this, you can see the uh, compound eyes and the various hairs like structures, which gives flies this whole concept of, uh, of uh, enhanced uh, sensory stuff, right? So have you ever tried, who, who here has tried uh, swatting a fly? I'm sure most of us would have, right? When they get irritating, land somewhere close, but I'm sure 99.99 of the times we'll miss. And it's only because of all these sensory um, fine hair that it, that it allows. And you notice how these legs are a lot curled up than the ones behind. And the interesting fact about most of these flies is they tend to jump backwards. So grasshoppers will have much more stronger and longer hind legs, which enables them to propel forward. The flies tend to uh, go backwards. Right, so now coming on to the, so we've seen the individual beauty of uh, insects so far, but there's also a lot of interdependence or teamwork. So we pride ourselves saying humans are great social animals. We uh, understand inter interdependency like not, nobody else, but have a look at what uh, the insects are capable of, right? So on the left, you see these paper wasps going ahead and building their nest. You can see the eggs and the larva here forming. And the closed ones are the ones where the larva is waiting to, waiting in its uh, pupil form. And what will emerge out is going to be a adult uh, paper wasp. So imagine they are forming this concept of a nursery where the whole uh, community takes care of uh, the growing up uh, children, right? And on the right, you find these uh, dwarf honeybees, the apis species. So they tend to hang around in numbers for, and they have a social hierarchy or structure with the queen uh, going ahead and laying large number of eggs and workers. And they also have guards for their colony. So you, this is a uh, image of the weaver ants beginning to fold uh, two leaves together to form a nest, right? So we all who've uh, been part of teams have seen how strategy and uh, the execution really matters. So here you see the manager on the left going ahead and giving instructions to all the workers while the workers uh, big, uh, work at pulling the uh, leaf together. So you notice, right, on the top left, this is probably one ant width. So there's one ant going ahead and trying to hold on to the uh, branch on one side and the, sorry, the twig on one side and the leaf edge on one side. But as you progress below, this definitely is more than one ant width. So what these do is go ahead and interlock their abdomen and the um, mandibles and form a chain. And using this chain, they go ahead and pull uh, leaves or uh, structures together. And then comes a different party which goes ahead and fetches the pupae from its nest. And the pupae give, provide the silk that is used to bind these structures together. So here again, you notice the uh, much larger uh, version of the uh, paper wasps which we saw earlier. So you, here you can see how the whole concept of a nursery works. Right, so a single ant wouldn't be able to move uh, food this large. So here you can see the crazy orange ants uh, taking care of a uh, dead owl fly. So who would have known they understand geometry? Right, these guys understand geometry. They figured out what is the diameter needed and but I think uh, just for fun sake, they didn't factor in these two or these two would have been the last gatekeepers who came in and went to sleep. So here are the pupae of uh, leaf beetles. So you can see the structure here, in fact, of some of them, right? And this uh, amazing phenomenon is called uh, cycloalexy. So 
So spiders, most of the times we have seen, they tend to be antisocial and uh, very isolated in their behavior, right? But there is this aberration where these are called social spiders, the stegodiphus uh, species, where they go ahead and form these really large nets. So some of these webs can go ahead and cover trees completely. It is that size that they get to. So here you see a freshly caught uh, grasshopper, which was jumped straight in. And all of these descend together like wolves to go ahead and take down the large uh, lunch pack. So here's again, good numbers of uh, bark lice hanging out together for strength in numbers. Right, so we, uh, we've always said humans right from the earlier uh, uh, evolution have been farmers farming for food, agriculture, and all that. So guess what? The ants are uh, as good as us as well. So here you notice, here's a horn tree hopper, the membracidae, and the eggs that it's protecting. And they are being protected by these weaver ants. So these weaver ants and other ants uh, maintain these farms of uh, sugar excreting bugs, right? So most often we see a lot of uh, bark lice, uh, tree hoppers, plant hoppers, all these in the nymphal forms will uh, produce this thing called uh, honeydew, which is a, a excess uh, sugars that they consume out of the uh, plant. So imagine having your own sugar factory. Right, so here's uh, a close up of pollen. I know people who have uh, breathing issues would wouldn't be the uh, most thrilled, but very the, this plays a very critical uh, role in the whole reproduction and uh, uh, spreading of uh, vegetation as well as flowers, right? So we may not have noticed, but honeybees play a critical uh, role in this. So you can notice just a small honeybee, the amount of pollen it is having on its uh, face. And if that, were, that weren't enough, so they also have these pollen collecting uh, packets on their thighs. So the kind of pollen that a single honeybee can uh, transport is pretty incredible. So here's a hunchbacked ant taking care of uh, some psyllid, uh, psyllid uh, adults. And they also perform doctor or uh, transportation services. So once the, there's an injured ant, so some of these worker ants will carry them back to the nest. Right, so with all of this uh, things in terms of numbers and taking care of each other, you would have thought insects would be like a plague or just take over everything that there is. But there is a certain balance in the whole ecosystem. And there's, a, there's what we call as natural control where everything is kept in check in its own little manner. And once you begin to understand the cycle, you will begin to appreciate why each species is very critical in maintaining this balance. So here you, we noticed the uh, pentatomid uh, uh, eggs, right? The shield bug eggs, which were hatching in numbers and all of that. So here you notice there's this wasp which comes ahead and uh, lays its egg in these shield bug eggs. Each uh, ha will have one of its own uh, egg. And then like a cuckoo, it will begin or assume its own parental duties and begin guarding these eggs for the benefit of its own offspring. And what will hatch out will be wasps from these eggs. So you notice, so some of these wasps which are just beginning to peak. And you notice the hatches aren't opening the, uh, like in the normal hatchwood, but they'll actually go ahead and make tiny holes and then emerge out of it. So this was one form where the, they went ahead and laid eggs in, uh, in others' eggs. What, is, what also is a very uh, common sight is wasps going ahead and injecting their eggs into the, into a unwilling host. So in this case, it was a moth caterpillar into which the eggs were injected. The eggs hatched the larvae, and then you can see the larvae 
uh, hanging out on the uh, host, which look like grapes. So the green ones are the actual larvae, which are on the uh, caterpillar. So moving on. So you, spiders also uh, form a good, a pretty critical in the whole uh, control of populations. So here's a green link spider taking care of a wing termite. So you would have noticed uh, uh, they, uh, some evenings following rains, there'll be like tons and tons of uh, wing termites that emerge out. So those are generally lapped up by a lot of uh, owlets, birds, and not to forget spiders and other insects as well. So there is inter and intra species predation also, which is here. And uh, robber flies like these are uh, very accurate and deadly predators. So, uh, so here you notice a hillis jumping spider taking care of a tree cricket. And this looked like some kind of a, a pupil case of something which was being carried back by these uh, weaver ants. So here are other various ways, right? So here you notice uh, a small crab spider taking care of a much larger ant. And even the spiders themselves aren't left alone. So here is a spider hunting wasp, which has dismembered. By dismembering, I mean it has just gone ahead and injected some uh, paralytic uh, thing into the spider and then removed all of its legs so that it is not, it's incapable of moving then the body of the spider will be buried into the ground and eggs laid inside for, guess what? The wasp uh, larvae to hatch and uh, eat the paralyzed yet alive spider inside out. And on the bottom, you see a uh, robber fly taking care of, I think what's a uh, white fly. Most gardeners would know this is a pretty bad pest. Right. So even the spiders, so uh, we noticed uh, two things, right? So one was where it was injected, the eggs were injected in, but there's also this very other interesting phenomenon where these orb weavers called the cyclosas are known to host these ectoparasitic wasps, which feed off the spider, which is still alive. So you notice the smaller form here and the much larger, uh, thing which is just going ahead and uh, hatching up, uh, sorry, feeding off the spider on the right side. So here's a jumping spider, two, tri two striped jumping spider taking care of a bottle fly. So we can see, uh, we can uh, generally in summers and where there is uh, rotting flesh around or a decaying matter, you'll see a lot of these uh, flies. So spiders, again, are very critical in terms of maintaining that balance. Here's a orb weaver taking care of a fungus weevil. So this, when I noticed first, I just thought it's just a hoverfly which is just sitting on the flower. But then it's only after I came back home and I noticed that there was a spider which was actually feeding off this. So this is a small uh, crab spider. Oh. All right. So, so far we noticed uh, all the various amazing things, right? In terms of predation, camouflage, but there are also this, also this very interesting facet, which I enjoy is watching the bizarre and the fascinating in the whole insect world, which is just filled. I, uh, I'm pretty convinced that when they, the designers for horror films or fantasy movies, when they went ahead and designed aliens, they didn't have to look too far, right? So here's three uh, shining examples. So the uh, structures that you see on the left and in the middle are formed by a same uh, moth caterpillar. It's called the bagworm moth caterpillar. So this uses all of the various things that it can find debris to go ahead and collect and build stuff. So imagine the kind of uh, calculation it needs to figure out uh, 
each stage. So it begins from the narrowest thing. And as it grows, it adds on additional uh, broken twigs or debris below. And it has to figure out how much it has grown and add that amount of girth in each phase. And on the uh, extreme right, you, uh, we've already just run past this. This is the uh, camouflage of the Poltis uh, spider, which makes it look just like a part of a twig. And it chooses the its uh, place. Uh, it chooses its uh, pl uh, place to rest just to match its uh, contour perfectly. So this is I call it as flat as it can get. So this again is a nymph of the other uh, Platyspidae uh, bug which we noticed earlier. So you notice how this blends in perfectly into the bark of the tree, and this is like maybe about. Uh, three to four mm in full uh, diameter. So this is like a pretty tiny thing. You really have to uh, go after them in terms of uh, trying to spot them, else you'll walk right past guaranteed 10 out of 10 times. So here's another very fascinating creature, what we call as the owl flies. So these are the owl fly larvae, which has just hatched out of the eggs. So you notice these are not the larval forms, so they'll not go ahead and uh, become. Uh... So moving on to the next. So here's another flatted uh, plant hopper. So you notice how it matches the uh, color and structure of the guava leaves in the background. A close up of the assassin bug with its really long antennae. And unfortunately, I couldn't get a close thing enough of the uh, proboscis that is used to inject uh, enzymes so that it goes ahead and uh, dilutes the innards of the insect. And the it is what is sucked back using the same proboscis as the fluidized jelly-like innards. So imagine you had to sleep every day by hanging on to a bar and just using your uh, mandibles or your jaws. That is exactly what this leaf cutter bee is doing. It rests in such a manner that it lift, lifts up all the legs and it clamps down using its very strong uh, mandibles onto branches. So here's another fascinating thing, which many have uh, of my Nature uh, photography friends are often kid that this really looks like a perfect uh, UFO, right? So you actually have these large eyes which give it uh, perfect depth perception and much tinier eyes which go all around and give it an almost 360 degree vision. So this is a jump, uh, two, two stripe jumping spider. Yeah, so as simple as watching just a dragonfly the moment you start getting closer is where it gets really fascinating, right? So the whole vein structure of the dragonfly is pretty amazing to watch. So you notice on the left, there is a mantis and on the right, there is a lace, green lace wing, right? So both amazing creatures on their own. And there is another, which almost looks like a hybrid, but it's not called the mantisipidae. So this is called the mantis fly. So you notice the front looks like a like that of a mantis, and the remaining structure looks that like that of a lace wing. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, we often uh, so we saw earlier about the uh, owl fly larvae which were just hatched, right? So a similar uh, structure also exists for these, but here we have a ant lion larva. So this goes ahead and forms uh, pits in the sand, waiting for ants to just go ahead and walk past. And the moment they uh, get onto that conical structure of the sand, they begin to start tripping. And that uh, this uh, nymph goes, uh, sorry, the larva goes ahead and spits out more sand and starts to uh, make the descent a lot faster. And then it preys on the ants, hence the common name called ant lion. Here's a very bizarre yet awesome looking lobster moth caterpillar. 
So this is a defensive pose, and we, as we got close, it just curled up into this. So here's the final form of the uh, caterpillar before it goes ahead and pupates. So you can actually notice it is begin to, beginning to curl up. And in a few hours, it'll form into a pupa for the chrysalis. And then what will emerge is the adult. So this again, we, uh, like the earlier thing, looks just like trash or debris. But here's a green lace, uh, lace wing larva. So these are very effective uh, aphid uh, controllers as well. So here you notice another farmer. So in this case, a uh, hunched ant, sorry, a hunchback ant, uh, interacting with these psyllid nymphs. So these you notice on the, th these are the ones. And on the rightmost thing, you can also see there's a scale insect. Right, so now coming to a very uh, interesting last bit. Uh, so Nikhil, would it be okay to go ahead and uh, un unmute others so that we just make this slightly interactive? Yes, sure. All right. Thank you. Guesses on what this is. I have been unmuted, so you can. Uh... Anyone? Mosquito larva. Awake? Sorry. Mosquito larva. Right. So that's the right answer. So this is a mus mosquito larva. Propagate. Sure, sure. All right. And here's a close up. So, I, I, sorry, I think uh, we just have too many people and uh, the interactive thing may not happen. So, here's a close up of the ant lion. This is an adult. So, you can see the compound structure and the fine hair. On the left here is the rolled up proboscis of a moth. So this was a dead moth I found. So used a very high magnification image to show how this stays and the scale structure. On the right, a uh, small dead ant, which I found on my laptop screen. So you can actually see the RGB pixels show up there. And on the bottom right is a very rare site I, the reason I say that rare is because of how effective the wasps generally are. So here's a shield bug uh, egg clutch, which have which saw a hundred percent uh, hatch rate. Right. Uh, so on the left, you see uh, this is what makes the basis of most uh, biological studies. So this is the close-up of the Drosophila or the fruit fly. Right. So we noticed earlier about how exoskeletons lend themselves well to understand uh, morphology and structure. So on the left here, you have the exoskeleton of a mantis, a praying mantis. On the middle, we have this uh, scale structure from a moth. Again, the same dead moth that I found. And on the right, the uh, bagworm moth uh, caterpillar, which has gone ahead and built its own mobile housing. Right. So here we notice the compound uh, eyes of the cicada and these three additional eyes are called ocelli, which help in additional uh, light and shadow perception. Right. So that's all I had for this. Thank you for the patience for people who are still awake. I think we can get to questions. Yeah, Shaila, take over. Yeah, so hi everyone and thank you so much Hayat for this absolutely fascinating talk and there were quite a lot of questions and of course a lot of admiration for your fabulous photography. So lots and lots and lots of questions um, about your camera equipment. Uh -huh. uh, could you just quickly just tell everyone that what sort of camera you use and uh, you know... Uh, is it like frightfully expensive or can just an amateur also dab their hands in it? Sure. All right. Uh, so just to uh, go ahead and 
make this slide better. Can you, I'll can, you, go, can you stop sharing your screen now? Yes, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, what I use currently is a uh, Olymp. Let me actually show that. Just give me one moment. Right. I used to uh, really have a pretty heavy setup before I started getting a lot of shoulder pain. And uh, also to make itself a little easier to handle, I use this uh, pretty light setup called the Olympus EMD, o OMD EM10 Mark II. So that's the body. And here what you see is a pretty lightweight or uh, easy to handle uh, macro lens called the Olympus 60mm. Right. Okay. And what I also at times use is a radio trigger to trigger an external flash away from the camera. So one, one of the ways is where you mount it directly on this and this is how you shoot, right? And because uh, when we, the moment you start using flash because of the micro contrast and brightness it gives, it'll give you a, a very contrasty and uh, burnt images. So what is recommended is we use diffusers in front of these to soften the light as much as possible. That is what gives you uh, the kind of detail and color that uh, I showcased today. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there was a question on, um, the, you showed the caterpillar with the larvae on it and mm -hmm. it was moving around with the larvae sort of feeding off it. Right. So uh, is, the, is the caterpillar aware that the larvae are on it and is there, is there any way it can shake them off or does it oh, get irritated it, it, by it, it uh, trust me, it definitely knows. I'm pretty sure it's pretty, uh, I don't know, uh, some say that insects like the uh, uh, stimuli for pain. Oh. I think it's backed by science as well. But I'm, I'm not sure I'll not go there. Uh, but I'm sure uh, I've actually seen caterpillars trying to jump off. Like uh, spiders, they also secrete silk, right? Okay. I've noticed yeah. the wasps, uh, like try, if, if there's a leaf, they come and uh, try injecting them with that. The moment they get to know, they try jumping off and hang oh. from the uh, trees. Right, right. So that are, definitely does happen. Are, are they, are they um, at all able to get rid of the larvae? Yeah. Are they able to have no, 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 they're not. Too late. Okay, Done. so that's, that's so the, too bad. The, the feeding apparatus is so, so strong. Right. So the strong. caterpillar gets eaten up eventually. Okay. Correct. All right. And then there was a question on spiders having eight eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, so how come all the spiders have the eight eyes, like more or less in the front of the head? Wouldn't it oh, kind of make that, more that's sense not, to that, have that's them all not, around? That's not always true, right? So if uh, okay. you notice the uh, jumping spiders, mm -hmm. the way they have the layout is all around. Okay. So you have these larger anterior median eyes and the anterior lateral, which are slightly smaller. And then there are some which go right around. So then they have 360 vision, is it? Some of them, yes. Okay, that's, that's interesting. And, uh, the uh, eye layout again forms a great uh, characteristic to uh, differentiate different different kinds of uh, families, spider families. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, do all um, insects see color? Do they all, all see color? Uh, uh, there are varied things, right? So some of them say uh, they, they have uh, UV vision as well. Mm -hmm. So some have mentioned uh, different ones based on uh, species it differs. Mm -hmm. So again, I am again... Uh, a uh, passionate hobbyist, not a trained uh, scientist, unfortunately, but uh, this is something I really enjoy. So if somebody has a question, maybe you can uh, post it to me, which is very specific, and I get it answered through an entomologist. Thank you. Uh, then you had, you had shown a circle of pupae, uh, mm -hmm. right? And right. then uh, there, were, there were some tiny things outside that circle. Right. What, so those, what... those, those, I call them as the uh, tent poles. So that is what is, gives them that leverage to go ahead and string the whole uh, silicon structure together. Okay. Okay. So it's like the pegging. Uh, the pegging. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. And also that, how do you, like you, you said you spent hours, um, uh, you know, taking the photograph of the cicada coming out. Um, mm -hmm. So how, you know, uh, did, did you, uh, did you know looking at the cicada that it was going to come out or, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what happened is, uh, I, on my Instagram, you can actually see the, uh, there's a video I made of the uh, several stages, mm. right? So yeah. what came out was a pretty green looking uh, mm. insect. Mm -hmm. 
right? So you can mm-hmm. actually see it is in its shell. Right. Looked unlike a cicada, but with the moment we saw it, we knew it was a freshly um, uh, what do you say emerged from the soil. It just crawled itself out and was looking for a good perch. And then once we it went ahead and perched itself safely enough, we gave gave ourselves a little time and documented the whole process. Okay. Okay. And any reason why the you know some of the nymphs that you showed uh, as soon as they hatch they're very bright. So mm-hmm. is there any purpose served in that or? Uh, so I think the bright color, uh, generally, I'm not sure on a specific thing on what it is. Uh, so again, this is uh, Chinmay on the call. Maybe uh, that, there's another friend of mine. He yeah. uh, he is a lot more knowledgeable than I am. <laughs> so I'm not sure if uh, the red color serves as a, uh, generally red, yellow, and all the other bright colors serve as warnings. So these could be mimicking it, or I don't know if they are really... Uh, not palatable at that particular stage. Okay. The color changes due to oxidation, that's for sure. And as the chitin react, it tends to darken and harden. Well, I think Chinmay has answered this in the chat, and it's the color of the fluids gushing through the vessels in the body. Sure. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank and you then too. someone has asked that do insects breed before rainfall? Um, you oh, know, so there, there that... are the various uh, things, right? So there's uh, this. Uh, myth or a notion where people say macro season lasts only during rain, but I've shot continuously barring the last two months for the last three and a half years and the amount of diversity and various life stages. So what may vary is the uh, volume or uh, density of insects, but definitely there is no fixed cycle itself. So some might prefer some flowering season in summer and some might prefer a much more damper thing. So you might see a varied thing, but there's definitely no lull or lack of activity in the insect kingdom. Okay, I think that about covers all the questions. Uh, so thank you very much, Ayat. That was sure. really, right. really right. fascinating and really, really amazing. I know, I, I, love, I, love, I love doing these sessions because <laughs> the way I say, tell it to my friends, it is, uh, makes me feel less of a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this personal thing as well. <laughs> One last question. Somebody has just said that how many spiders are poisonous? Are all of them poisonous? Right. So th- there's this other thing where uh, I'll go back to a slight basic thing. Poison and venom are two yes. different things. Poison yes. is what you consume. That is yes. what is poisonous. So you don't want to eat a spider. Right? That's when it becomes <laughs> uh, poisonous. So I-, I get your question. The question should actually be, uh, is it venomous? Right. Yes. So uh, there are a few which can cause some rashes, right? And uh, I think in India, then there aren't too many uh, which can give you any kind of real thing. So the main reason for that is the kind of the pincers during which, using which they go ahead and inject venom is they're too uh, brittle to even uh, go and perforate uh, human skin. Mm. So but they all, they all have venom uh, for their prey. That's like for, their for digestive their prey, yeah. and, yeah. and, and you, you, Correct. So you can imagine the uh, uh, size difference between a spider and its prey and that of a human. Right. right. Again, that said, uh, I would again recommend uh, if you aren't uh, knowledgeable or know enough, do not go ahead and ha- try handling insects or spiders. That's very important. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. It was fantastic. Very enriching. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Pleasure thanks to all for joining in. Yeah. And see you all next weekend. Yeah. Stay safe. Right. Bye. 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 Thanks, Ayat. Thanks, Nikhil.